Okay, as we continue our series of tree anatomy videos, let's talk about roots. So roots, of course, are fundamentally important to trees. Um, they do a lot of things. Number one, they, they anchor trees in the soil. Trees are really tall, so they face a lot of, of wind and other sorts of disturbances that could topple them over if they didn't have a good, strong anchor in the soil. Um, of course, they absorb water and nutrients. So the water and other sort of nutrients from the soil that need to go up to the leaves for photosynthesis, as well as to synthesize compounds for growth and structure. Um, they store carbohydrates. So many species of trees store a lot of their uh, sugars that are produced in the leaves are sent down to the roots um, where they're synthesized into carbohydrates and stored there. Um, the roots also synthesize a, a bunch of other compounds too. Uh, they also secrete chemical substrates. So sometimes they'll secrete things into the soil or into their, uh, their own cells. Um, and in some species, they'll generate vegetative shoots. So species that can re-sprout after disturbance from the root collar or um, uh, trees that, that generate um, vegetatively. Uh, roots can come out, penetrate the soil um, and, and grow vegetative shoots. So let's look at root structure. Um, so over here on the left, you can see sort of a, a, a tangential view of the uh, of a root. And so you see at the bottom, we have a root cap of productive, uh, protective tissue. Circle that there. So down here, we have the root cap, and that's a mass of cells to protect the growing part of the root. So roots, remember, have primary and secondary growth. So primary growth is, is lengthening uh, of that apical meristem. And so we have that meristematic tissue right here behind the root cap. Um, and then they have secondary growth, which we'll talk about later, where they um, lignify, they get woody and thicker. Um, but of course, then another main part of the, the root is the vascular tissue. So here we can see um, the interior of the root cell is this vascular cylinder, and that vascular cylinder contains xylem and phloem, our vascular tissues that move photosynthate down from the leaves and that move water and nutrients up. Um, another thing you'll notice is roots have, the finest roots have root hairs, um, which are very, very fine. Um, you know, we're talking about 0.2 millimeters to one millimeter in diameter. And they're usually less than a millimeter long, usually like a quarter millimeter long, but very fine uh, root hairs to make good soil contact and absorb water and nutrients. Um, over here on the right, you can see the um, a cross section of a young root, of a primary root. Um, and again, we can see our vascular bundles in here. So we have our vascular cylinder in the middle with xylem and phloem. Um, we have cortex tissue uh, and we see the root hairs on the sides. Um, we have, uh, of course, the root hairs come out of this epidermis, um, which is a, you know, a, a layer that's meant to uh, protect the cells inside and uh, be relatively waterproof. We also have an endodermis, which is sort of the red here, um, which similarly protects the vascular cells inside. Um, there's a, a special feature in those cells called the Casparian strip, which is a watertight um, layer. Um, but materials can be passed through that, especially uh, in cells that are connected to the root hairs. So uh, trees have different kinds of roots. If we look at this sort of cartoon cross section here, um, so at the base of the at the base of the trunk, I uh, usually see a swelling there, and that's called the root collar. Um, so that's sort of your transition between the shoot and, and the root. Um, many species, but not all, have a tap root. So this is a root that can go down, oh, you know, a couple of meters deep um, into the soil to anchor it. Not all species have tap roots. Some have more, you know, fibrous root systems uh, that don't go very deep at all. Um, and then around the, um, let's see if I can get rid of these. Um, around the... Uh, uh, the main part of the, the roots near the near the trunk or near the bowl. Um, these are really generally pretty thick, chunky, woody roots. Uh, so we may have up to a dozen of these. These can get, uh, you know, tens of centimeters in diameter. Uh, they can get very thick indeed. They're very woody. They have a lot of secondary growth. These are sort of our major lateral roots, our major um, our major woody, woody lateral roots uh, that are there for, for structural support. Together, they're often called the root plate. Um, and the root plate might extend, you know, almost as far as the edge of the canopy here, at the edge of the, um, uh, where the, where the canopy comes out. Um, and if you're, if a tree is uprooted, 
we can usually see that root plates so over here in the on the right we can see a, a tree that's been thrown over by the wind and we can see sort of those those chunky woody um, roots of the root plate um, now in addition to those the those sort of framework roots we also have um, a lot of sort of narrow ropey kind of uh, of roots and so that's sort of most of these um, and those are, you know, we're talking about maybe one to five centimeters in diameter. Um, they're generally pretty flexible and rope-like. Um, they usually extend farther in the direction of prevailing wind. So if, a, if the wind tends to come from one direction, uh, the roots will extend. So if the wind is coming this way, uh, the roots will extend this way. Um, and they, again, they're sort of like guy lines that anchor the tree uh, against the wind and, and against any kind of uh, disturbance. Um, but they're also just sort of growing out. They're growing through any kind of areas, the path of least resistance, right? So soft soils and cracks and, and um, organic material and so on. Um, and they're basically exploring. Uh, and if, uh, if a root like that hits a pocket of um, a lot of nutrients, a lot of soil nutrients, organic material, or an area that has good soil water, um, then it will grow a lot of fine roots along that area. So if I get rid of some of these scribbles here, um, and what you can see here, are these very finest roots here, um, we see bunches of them, and those are called feeder roots. Now it's important not to confuse them, you know, with photosynthesis, right? The food, the carbon that a tree creates is um, is obtained by the photosynthesis in the leaves, but um, water and soil nutrients come in through the feeder roots. These things are. Um, you know, usually, you know, less than a millimeter in diameter, um, about, you know, about 0.2 to 1 millimeters in diameter. Uh, so very fine, a lot of contact with the soil. Now, uh, the di kind of like the diagram I just showed in the last slide, um, it's important to remember that the vast majority, for the vast majority of trees, the roots do not, do not go very deep. So a lot of times you'll see a drawing of a tree like this on the left, and that is not correct. Uh, tree roots do not extend like the canopy of a tree just underground. Um, they, they are mostly uh, in the top two meters of soil. And the vast majority of roots are in the top one meter of soil. And the vast, vast majority of feeder roots, which are most of the roots, um, are in the top you know, 10 to 20 centimeters of soil. So roots do not go super deep as long as they sort of spread out um, and, and access the pockets of uh, moisture and nutrients that they need. They don't need to go very deep in most places, um, but they do spread very far laterally, uh, sometimes two to three times the height of a tree. Um, more typically, you know, 20 to 30 meters is how far those sort of lateral roots will extend into the soil. In sandy soils uh, that are loose, they can extend much farther. In heavier soils, they don't go quite as far. Um, but you can get uh, a fair number of different sort of structures of roots depending on the substrate and the availability of water and the availability of nutrients. Here's a few different sort of diagrams of, of how these things work. Um, but if you look at you know examples like F here uh, and, and H, uh, in, in some places you can get a taproot or some sinker roots. So roots that go sort of vertically down are called sinker roots. Um, and so in H here, you can see, so we have our sort of typical roots in the upper part of the soil. Um, but if this is a particularly dry site, we might get some, a sinker root or sinker roots that come down and then diverge down here to tap into some lower, um, lower profiles of, of lower horizons of the soil that might have more water or more nutrients. If the soils are particularly leached and the water has taken a lot of nutrients down deeper, um, deeper roots can grow to exploit that. Uh, or if there's just if a, you're in a place where it's very dry or seasonally dry, uh, the trees will grow some deeper roots to get at some deeper patches of water. Here's just another diagram uh, of, um, of of how roots grow. So in the in the top panel, we can see sort of a um, a look down on the the tree. So here's the stem right here and the roots extending below ground, and then we see sort of a profile view on the bottom. And so again, if we look at those roots, they can extend for many meters away from the tree. Uh, you can see those sort of rope-like narrow diameter um, roots. And then you can see the clusters of feeder roots wherever those roots reach something, um, reach some water uh, or nutrients. And in the cross-sectional view, you can see the profile of the, 
uh, topography here, the hillside, and you can see a lot of those feeder roots are right there in the very top of the soil and even up into the uh, leaf litter and some of the organic material that's on top above the soil. Uh, and this is a problem uh, sometimes. So this is a ponderosa pine tree and you can see the, the incredible amount of, of litter, uh, all the needles that are built up around the bottom of the tree. Um, and the reason is the well, ponderosa pine is a very fire prone uh, forest type. So they would typically burn every two to seven years in under a natural fire regime. And that would burn up all the litter, all the needles and cones and, and twigs and everything that's on the ground. Um, but humans have been very good at putting out fire and the, the, the federal government and state governments as a matter of policy for the past over 100 years have been putting out fires. And so these fuels have built up. If we put out fires and we don't allow them to burn, then we get a buildup of, of litter. And so the trees start to grow a lot of their fine roots, a lot of their feeder roots into that uh, litter layer. Um, so this is this is a big problem in um, in the West. We have the same problem in uh, as ponderosa pine forests here in coastal redwood forests. So this is these are coastal redwood trees on the northern coast of California, and similarly the same thing. Uh, this is a forest type that is historically burned r relatively regularly, and that would clear up a bunch of the organic material on the on the forest floor. Um, with hundreds of years of fire suppression, or over 100 years of fire suppression, the fine root systems have grown up into these litter layers. And we can see the you know, big, big litter layer here, and the fine roots will grow up in there. Now this is a problem when we put fire back into the system. And so one of the big impacts on coastal redwoods and even you know, other sorts of trees like ponderosa pine, if you have a lot of the fine root system growing in the litter, then you have a fire that burns up the litter, you're burning up a lot of the fine root systems of these trees too. Fine roots aren't down in the soil where they're a little more insulated. Um, a lot of times these can grow back and the trees will be you know, stressed for a little while until they regrow them, but uh, if the damage is severe enough, it can be enough to kill the tree. And so you might see you know, a fire pass through a, uh, a stand of trees and those trees will be green, and still have green needles for you know, even a couple of years before they start to die from the, um, the damage to the root system. Okay, how do roots grow? Um, they grow a little bit differently at different times of the year uh, than shoots. Uh, we can think of roots as sort of like shoots underground uh, with, some, with some differences. Uh, and those fine roots, those feeder roots, are pretty much like leaves. They're, they, they typically don't last very long. Uh, in some species, they may just last a few days. Uh, in others, it may last sort of a growing season, but they don't, not many feeder roots will actually overwinter um, because they're not, they're not woody. Um, so they regrow their, their feeder roots. Uh, so, so kind of like shoots, uh, but you see temporarily that's really different. So this is data from uh, Eastern white pine. And you can see the dashed line here is shoot growth. And we can see that shoot growth peaks uh, in uh, late spring, early summer, so around June, uh, the, the beginning of June, we see a peak in shoot growth and then it declines um, pretty, reg pretty rapidly. Eastern white pine, of course, is a species that has determinate growth and so shoot grows and then uh, more resources go into the terminal bud. Um, but root growth kind of stretches out over a longer period of time. Again, we see a peak in the early summer, so the solid line is roots. Um, then we see a little bit of a dip uh, in mid to late summer, uh, probably because of drought conditions uh, as the, the soil is drier. And then we see another, another peak in, uh, the, in the fall. Uh, and root growth kind of continues. It drops off, but, uh, and then it stops pretty, um, uh, pretty abruptly uh, once soil temperatures get cooler. So uh, the, the shoots are exposed to air. Air temperature, of course, drops off. Uh, much more rapidly than the soil temperature, but once the soil gets cold enough, then uh, we see an ending of, of root growth. So as I mentioned previously, um, some trees will have uh, roots that can go deeper. So you, you typically, most trees will have their roots in the top meter or two of soil, uh, but then in dry conditions, you may have a tap root or some sinker roots going down and then some deeper roots. Um, and this can lead to what used to be called hydraulic lifting and is now called hydraulic redistribution. 
So look over here on the left and we see here in the dry season, there's a lot of moisture stress on this tree. So during the daytime, you can see the in red, the red dashed lines, um, the tree is drying up, whatever water it can get from the um, upper roots uh, will go in and up through to the leaves. Um, and then uh, also the water, there's probably more water deeper down uh, and that'll go into the deeper roots and all the way up to the leaves. Um, but at night, when the air temperature is cooler and there's not as much moisture stress uh, on the leaves, not as much demand of water from the leaves, um, also there's no light reactions of photosynthesis, so there's not as much water demand from the leaves, the water will still come up, uh, you can see in the blue, this is what's happening at night, the water will still enter and come up those, um, those deeper roots, um, but then it'll come out to and through the upper roots, and even sometimes get out into the soil. Um, and the reason this is called hydraulic redistribution and not just hydraulic lifting is because we don't just lift the water up from the deep roots to the shallow roots, um, but in the wet season, if there's plenty of moisture here, uh, it'll, it can flow the other way too. We can flow from the shallow roots down into the deep roots. Um, this is sometimes beneficial to the tree because in times of moisture stress, uh, you can keep those fine, those fine roots alive up higher uh, by supplementing them with moisture from deeper roots. So it's, it's usually a good thing for the tree uh, in that you can keep those fine roots alive. Then if you go to the wet season um, and there's plenty of moisture in the upper levels of the soil from precipitation, then those fine roots can do a better job. So you can tap into two different levels of, of moisture and you can keep two levels of roots alive. Another interesting thing about roots is the idea of root grafting. So root grafting is basically the union of cambium layers uh, between two roots. Uh, and this can occur between two roots of the same tree, or it can even occur between roots of different trees. Um, this happens a lot in, in stands of trees where you have a lot of the same species, and you'll see a lot of trees of the same species, but different individuals grafting roots together. But it has been documented between trees of different species as well. Over here on the right, you can see what's called a living stump. So this is a tree that was cut down, and you can see there's bark that's grown over the top of that stump, and there's living cambium tissue underneath there. Um, so how does this how does this stump stay alive without any uh, without any leaves to do photosynthesis? Well, its roots are grafted to some nearby trees, and that can provide photosynthate to the cambium there. The roots of this stump can provide um, additional water and soil nutrients to any of the living trees that it's grafted to. Some other interesting things about roots is some species have symbioses that um, help the trees um, bring in other nutrients. <clears throat> One of the common ones is um, a symbiosis with any number of uh, species of the genus Rhizobium. So that's a bacterium. Uh, and there's, there's a whole bunch of species of rhizobium. Uh, they tend to be associated with, with plants in the pea family, the Fabaceae family. So trees like black locust here um, will have these nodules on the roots. These nodules will be filled with this um, rhizobium bacteria. And that bacteria is, is special because it can, it can uh, fix nitrogen. So it can fix nitrogen directly from um, the, the air in the soil. Uh, so our air, our atmosphere has a lot of nitrogen in it, but it's nitrogen in a form that's not useful to plants. It's N2. Um, and it's very difficult to break the bonds of N2 because you've got two nitrogen atoms bonded very strongly together. But the rhizobium bacterium can do it. And it can change the form of that nitrogen to ammonium or another form that uh, the plants can directly take up. Nitrogen is really important for building cells. Um, so this is a really uh, beneficial symbiosis for the for the plant to have. Uh, it feeds the bacterium carbon uh, and the bacterium fixes nitrogen for the plant. Another important symbiosis is mycorrhiza. So mycorrhiza are different types of fungi that again have a symbiosis between uh, the plant roots. Um, so here we can see one type of mycorrhiza, it's called ectomycorrhiza because it's mostly on the exterior of the leaf. Uh, and we see um, the fungus is made up mostly of hyphae. Uh, hyphae are these little root-like structures. They're very, very fine hairs, and you can see a whole mat of them or a fungal sheath surrounding the root of this tree. In the middle here is a diagram, and so most of those hyphae 
are um, on the outside of the root, but some of them go into the intercellular space between the roots and uh, feeds on the carbon of the tree. So the tree provides carbon for the fungus. What the fungus provides for the tree is tons more surface area and a lot more contact with the soil. So a lot more opportunity to bring in water and to bring in soil nutrients, especially nitrogen and phosphorus and things like that. Um, so a very important symbiosis. Now some trees can, um, you know, some trees uh, benefit from uh, mycorrhizal symbioses, but it's not required. So things like birches and maples, uh, if they're if they're colonized by mycorrhizal fungi, they get some benefit from that, but they can they can grow uh, and and fully without it. Um, but some species, especially uh, a lot of beeches, oaks, and pines, uh, actually require. Uh, symbiosis with with mycorrhizal fungi or they can't grow uh, normally and so one extreme example of that is uh, pinus radiata this is monterey pine <clears throat> now monterey pine was originally its native range was just in a few little pockets along the coast of california here so you can see some of these arrows are pointing to where monterey pine was originally distributed and it was discovered in the oh, i think late uh, late 19th century or middle 19th century um, but it's a great pine for for lumber production it's uh it grows really tall it grows really straight it doesn't have a lot of knots in it um, and it grows relatively fast so uh, really early on after it was discovered, a lot of people were trying to propagate it and grow it in other places. It especially seems well suited to climates of the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, so sort of like these little microclimates along the coast of California, um, people tried growing it in South America, New Zealand, Tasmania. Um, but at first it didn't work. Um, the, the plantations just failed. The trees would, would not grow very well. Uh, they'd die in the seedling or sapling stage. Um, it wasn't until uh, the discovery that they had a very specific uh, symbiosis with an ectomycorrhizal fungi and really depended on that fungi uh, to bring in nutrients and to bring in soil water. So then um, once that, that was inoculated or once that was um, the fungus was isolated from the soil, uh, the tree roots could be inoculated with the fungal spores before planting. And now um, Monterey pine is one of the widest planted pines in the world. Um, it's planted again in South America, the temperate regions of South America, in Argentina, um, in Tasmania, in New Zealand, and so on. Um, there's so much pine uh, lumber production from Pinus radiata uh, that if you go to one of the big box uh, stores with lumber yards like the Home Depot, uh, there's a very good chance if you buy white pine lumber uh, from one of those stores, even in the United States. Uh, it's probably uh, coming from South America or New Zealand and uh, shipped here. So that's roots. Uh, in the next video, we'll talk about uh, reproductive structures of plants.